All right, Mr. Chair, I think we're ready to begin. Good morning. Um, I'm Santa Cruz County Supervisor Bruce McPherson. I'd like to call to order the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors meeting of May 18th, 2021 at the hour of 9 a.m. Uh, clerk, please call the, call the roll. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Very well. Okay. With item number two, we'll have a moment of silence and a pledge of allegiance. And I understand that uh, Supervisor Friend would like to uh, mention someone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to acknowledge the passing of a great second district resident, Al Aramburu. Uh, many of you probably know Al from his work here in the Planning Commission for multiple terms, but uh, many also know him from his work across the state. He served on the Marin County Board of Supervisors for multiple terms. Uh, the Tiburon City Council before that, um, even served in the U.S. Army. Um, I'd like to also note that due to his conservation work in San Francisco Bay, there's an island named after Al, actually, in Richardson Bay in Marin County. Um, mm -hmm. Al just really was a great person, served a lot. Uh, his entire life was dedicated to public service, and I appreciate the opportunity to have this board recognize him in a moment of silence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other board member? Okay, we will now have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three, we'll have consideration of late additions to the agenda, additions and deletions uh, of the consent and regular agendas. Mr. Palacios. Uh, yes, uh, Chair McPherson and members of the board, we have a, a couple of changes to the agenda. On the consent agenda, item number 23, there's additional materials. There's an attachment D, public correspondence. On item number 40 on the consent agenda, there's additional materials. There's a bid summary, 2021 attachment D. Uh, that concludes the, the corrections to the agenda. Okay, fine. Um, we have any announcement by the board members of items to be removed from the consent uh, to the regular agenda? Seeing none, uh, we will move to item number five for public comment. This is a moment for any person uh, to address the board once during public comment, not exceeding two minutes. Comments must be directed to items on the today's consent or closed session agendas, yet to be heard items on the regular agenda or on a topic not on today's agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors. We'll take public comments now for up to 30 minutes. If necessary, additional time will uh, be made for public comments uh, after the last item on today's regular agenda. Uh, Ms. Cabrera, do we have any uh, public comments? Yes, and I also noticed that Supervisor Caput's hand is raised. Oh, excuse me, I didn't see that. Yes, oh, I'll make a, I'm sorry, I'll make a comment after. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have Matt Machado, the Director of Public Works and Deputy CAO. He will be the first speaker. Okay. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good morning, Chairman, Supervisors, um, CAO Palacios, Council Heath. I want to thank the board for declaring the week of May 16th through the 22nd as Public Works Week in Santa Cruz County. Public Works is the combination of physical assets, management practices, policies, and personnel necessary for government to provide and sustain structures and services essential to the welfare and quality of life for its citizens. In Santa Cruz County, that includes water, wastewater, recycling and solid waste, flood control, stormwater management, and roads. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication by our staff to make this happen day in and day out. I want to thank you and the community for your continued support. Under the leadership of Carlos Palacios and your policy and guidance, we are making great strides forward to a stronger and more resilient system of public works for the betterment of our community. Thank you for this opportunity to share. 
Very good. I just want to say uh, Public Works, a phenomenal job that you've done. We've had storm after storm since 19, or 2016. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal work. And uh, to credit to your Public Works Department, they've done an outstanding job with the resources we've had. And uh, you're to be commended and thank all of your Public Works Department. Carol, your microphone is unmuted. Good morning. What legal authority does Dr. Ferris Sabah, the superintendent of the County Office of Education and the 13 district leaders have to require our sons and daughters in school in Santa Cruz County to wear face coverings? Despite a recent change in CDC guidelines on face coverings and despite the removal of the local face covering guidance by our local health officer, Dr. Ferris Sabah and the district leaders have unilaterally decided that they have the authority to continue requiring face coverings for our sons and daughters attending schools in Santa Cruz County. I submit to you that they have no legal authority for this whatsoever. Um, I wanna point to your attention an email I sent to you all except for um, Supervisor Koenig. Um, because he was not in office at that time. This email's back from June of 2020, June 29, 2020. It's a whole list of scientific authorities that conclude that face coverings do not prevent the spread of disease and that they are harmful to the wearer. Specifically, there was a great article by Dr. Um, Russell Blaylock that says face masks pose serious risks to the healthy. Further, I also submitted a study to you that was done in Wuhan, China. It was published at nature.com. The study was about 10 million Chinese people and they decided and they concluded in that study, there is no asymptomatic, asymptomatic transmission of the coronavirus. So with all of this in mind, I would like to strongly encourage all of you today to send a letter to Dr. Sabah and these 13 leaders, please strongly rebuke their gross overreach of authority to require face coverings for our sons and daughters in Santa Cruz schools. And please demand that they remove this guidance immediately so our children can breathe freely. Caller 2915, your microphone is unmuted. Good morning, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. I uh, want to again uh, ask that there be some place that is available for members of the public like me who cannot participate via video on your board meetings during the budget hearing so that we can see the screen presentation that staff gives to you uh, so that we can participate and be knowledgeable of how our county is operating financially. It could be simple. It could be in the county building. But there needs to be some alternative for members of the public who participate only via telephone to be able to be informed of these budget hearings. I would also like to uh, really uh, question uh, consent item 17, why the county would put an item like this spending $43 million with 11 resolutions doing so on the consent agenda. It is incredible. This item should be publicly discussed. I have looked at some of the resolutions. They're very vague. $1 million to the CAO's office for sick pay. I would like to understand that better. And this type of uh, allocation of enormous public money merits public discussion and staff reports publicly. Finally, I would like to say that there is a new report out on the highly contaminated area at 1500 Capitola Road. That's the 57 affordable housing units, low-cost medical and dental. The report is out. All groundwater samples are contaminated. Most of the samples in the soil were above the residential and commercial MCLs, maximum contaminant levels. This site must be remediated, and I urge you to stop the development. Call in user one. Your microphone is available. Uh, 
This is Marilyn Garrett. Thanks to the two previous speakers, so rude to cut people off in mid-sentence. Santa Cruz County and globally 5G satellites and their base stations on Earth are proliferating with no informed consent of we, the people. Here are just a few of the consequences. In an article entitled The Contagion Fairy Tale, Dr. Thomas Cowan states that the authors postulate that the illness can be very serious and that the likely cause is radiation poisoning, probably from the worldwide deployment of 5G starting in Wuhan, China, and followed by major cities throughout the world. In another article entitled 5G and the Military, Marriage Made in Hell, uh, Bruce Gagnon, who is with the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, states, it is no surprise that the corporate media is pushing 5G so widely and eagerly without the slightest bit of critical thought. The Pentagon knows that the faster speeds from 5G will enable greater speed Phase surveillance, targeting, and offensive military operations as a result. And oh, let's see where it is. Oh, here's another quote on 5G and killer drones. Con Hallinan. In just the first year of his administration, Trump killed more people, including 200. Caller 5959, your microphone is available. Good morning. Um, I don't know if this is the exact time to speak since I've never done this before, but this is in regards to the assessments which are on the agenda at uh, Place de Mer in La Selva Beach. My name is Ellen Simons Fox, and I own 165 Holiday Drive in La Selva Beach. Um, uh, is this an okay time to talk about this? Well, you can. You won't be. We're, it's on the agenda, and you'll, you'll be able to start your two minutes in a minute, moment. But we have a public hearing on that uh, right after we can uh, conclude this opening uh, remarks on the consent okay. agenda. You can wait till then. So if, if I can, wish. of course, I'm happy to. I'll do that. Okay. Very well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chair. That concludes all the public speakers for public comment. Okay. Um, the, uh, Mr. Caput, did you, Supervisor Caput, did you have a comment to make? Maybe it was on item number four. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I did, item number 24, I just wanted to welcome uh, Sam. But oh, wait, no, excuse, excuse me for just a minute then. You just want to comment on the uh, agenda? Yeah, right. Okay, then we'll go to item number six, uh, action on the consent agenda. Mr. Caput, go ahead, you can start. Yeah, uh, item number 24, I wanna welcome uh, Sam Budman to the Pajaro Valley Public uh, Cemetery uh, District Board of Trustees. And uh, uh, he's a longtime resident and he served on that board before. And uh, he's gonna be a, a great asset to the county, thank you. Okay, that's that's the uh, only comment you had on the consent agenda then, is that correct? I guess, yeah, okay. Uh, Supervisor Koenig? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, on item 17, we're accepting the funds related to the American Rescue Plan. Uh, it's, I uh, look forward to continuing to, to um, define plans for how we use some of the board directed funds on this. Um, in particular, in related to the broadband funds, um, a, a thorough study of where the needs are in the county and, and where we're going to get the most bang for our buck uh, in terms of extending broadband service. Uh, then, as far as the apprenticeship programs, I also look forward to learning more about the MC3 program that the Workforce Development Board uh, suggested and some of its current enrollment rates um, and whether that's, that is the best way to proceed uh, if, if new classes provided would actually be filled. 
Um, and of course, then as far as uh, supporting women and minority owned businesses, I look forward to seeing uh, more as a uh, defined strategy going forward for that as well. Uh, on item 20, I want to thank Emily Hansen for volunteering to serve on the Human Services Commission. Uh, she'll bring uh, depth of knowledge, uh, both as uh, currently working for Green Waste and um, some of the job skills uh, or, or um, job related programs she's run, uh, as well as having lived experience uh, with her father suffering from homelessness. So she's very passionate about uh, this issue area, and I think that she'll be a fantastic public servant. Uh, on item 23, um, I want to thank my colleagues for bringing forward the su support of the End of Life Act. Even in uh, discussing this within the first district office, we have a, a number of folks who uh, have experienced this issue firsthand, um, and it's great to see the board supporting this. On item 28, metro electrification for uh, non-revenue vehicles. You know, this is really going to help move metro towards um, you know, larger electrification of the fleet in general uh, and, and having more support services available for electric vehicles. So uh, thank you, Chair McPherson, for bringing that forward. I think item 34 was, was perhaps one of the most interesting items on the uh, consent agenda. I learned a lot about the Mental Health Services Act and the way our county allocates funds for mental health. Uh, and I uh, was excited to note that there is funds specifically for innovation in there. and um, you know, I also noted that this is not specifically, a, you know, it doesn't represent a permanent contract with any of the suggested services. And I look forward to working with the Director of Health Services uh, to continue to improve the way we provide mental health services in our county. And then finally, I just want to thank Public Works for uh, the completion of work on Redwood Lodge Road, Item 38, uh, and Vine Hill Road with Item 39. That's it. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Um, Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Also on item 17, I appreciate the work of the County Administrative Office on the American Rescue Plan uh, Recovery Act funding and um, agree with Supervisor Koenig just about, um, in regards to the RFP on broadband, I think that some of the metrics to consider would be a number of households served disadvantaged community status, whether or not the expansion is, uh, of that middle mile would also in the future allow us to expand to other homes. So for example, if it serves say 70 homes, but uh, the line could then be extended on at a much cheaper rate for future homes, that that would also be something in the consideration. And since it is COVID related uh, funding, areas that were disproportionately hit by COVID would be uh, something that we should consider in the RFP. All recognizing though that $500,000 is really just a baseline investment in something that needs a much broader investment. I do know that the state uh, in their May revise is proposing the potential for additional funding. We have no real idea of how much will actually be allocated in that funding. We also don't know if there would be, if that money would come to local governments, if it would come uh, just to service providers, if it would be a public-based network funded by the state or whether we'd even need local funding as a match should there be a, a local requirement. So I think that it makes sense to continue this uh, locked in this, this $500,000 investment even in the face of what could come down from the state. I think that if we do an RFP by the time uh, such a thing were to be awarded, we'd have greater understanding of any sort of state or federal funds that would be coming in and whether this is duplicative or additive or what it may be. And there can be flexibility built into the decision making of the board at that time. But I think that uh, this need is, was evidenced during uh, the COVID, during the pandemic, especially for our local students and some of the households trying to do telehealth and, and remote work. We really have a long way to go to build out this infrastructure, and this is an important baseline investment. But I agree with Supervisor Koenig that, that we need to get as many homes as we can uh, set up in this situation. I look forward to seeing what the RFP says. Uh, in regards to item 23, I'd just like to appreciate the work of my colleague, Supervisor Coonerty, who brought this forward to my attention. Uh, this California End of Life Option Act, which was passed in 2016, a lot of work was done by, at that time, State Senator Bill Monning on this. And this is something that we need to extend and make permanent. I think it's an important component. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Coonerty. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Everyone uh, said everything that I was going to say about all the <laughs> all the items. So um, I uh, I appreciate the work of staff and my colleagues. Um, and I don't have anything to add. Thank you, um, Mr. Cap uh, Supervisor Capit has already spoken. I do too want to just mention something on uh, item seventeen. Um, 
in a uh, call with uh, the California State Association of Counties, or CSAC, uh, in Governor Newsom's um, May revise, he has $7 billion uh, proposed for broadband and how that relates to our budget and what we can do and the matching criteria, if there is some, um, we'll find out. But uh, that's going to be um, a very important item and it is in the state level too. Um, the um, the uh, letter to number uh, 28, the letter to U.S. Senator Alex Padilla uh, to Metro, I wanna really compliment um, all of our public agencies in Santa Cruz County that uh, have worked diligently to submit proposals uh, for congressionally directed funding, especially the county departments. Uh, the funding opportunity for Metro, of which I sit as along with uh, Supervisor Koenig, will backfill the funding necessary to continue replacing the fleet with electric buses. I, I really want to compliment Metro for being aggressive and being out front on this, this issue. Uh, if we have more electric buses, a lot of people ride those. And we hope that more people will when the pandemic is literally over. Um, and uh, just thank Metro for its uh, uh, foresight and uh, the necessity that we have to move toward electric buses in the future. It's been on the, the the agenda of Metro for many years, and it's uh, it's really a compliment to them that we be aggressive in getting these electric buses. So with that, I will um, move to uh, hear a motion on the, uh, uh, to approve the consent agenda. So moved, Coonerty. Second, Koenig. Koenig, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Now we will go to item number seven. This is the one that one of our uh, residents uh, wanted to speak on. Uh, it's a public hearing. Um, item number seven is a public hearing to consider formation of the assessment district 21-01. Uh, place the mayor continue the item to allow for tabulation and certification of the assessment ballots. Return the uh, item to announce results of the balloting, accept the cert certification of the vote results, adopt a resolution adopting the engineer's report confirming the assessment, ordering work and acquisitions, adopt a resolution authorizing issuance of bonds, approving and directing the execution of a fiscal agreement, bond purchase agreement and official statements, authorize the deputy CAO director of public works to award and sign contract and direct public works to return on or before August 24th, 2021 for ratification of this contract award and to take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the deputy CAO director of public works. And be, uh, below that, we have items uh, A through H about the resolutions and the fiscal agent and engineer's report. Um, we will uh, now have a presentation on uh, the public hearing from the staff. Good morning, Chair and Board Members. I'm Kent Edler, Assistant Director with the Department of Public Works. I'll be giving a brief presentation on the County Service Area 2, or CSA 2, Place Demir Septic System Project and Assessment District Formation. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, so, um, so as shown on the picture, CSA 2 is located just south of Manresa State Beach in the location circled in red. It was established in 1963 and includes numerous services. However, the most substantial service is the operation and maintenance of the community sewer slash septic system. The CSA is comprised of 93 parcels, however, only 78 of which are actually connected to the community septic system. 15 parcels in what we refer to as zone H, shown in light blue, have individual septic systems. Briefly, the system takes wastewater from the parcels along the ocean, along Ocean View Drive, where, where it's pumped to a series of septic tanks where the solids settle out. From the tanks, wastewater effluent is pumped to a series of leach pits where the effluent drains into the soil. Parcels adjacent to the leach pit also have their wastewater directed to the septic to the septic tanks and leach pits. These leach pits were installed in 1964, so they are 57 years old and beyond their useful life. Back in 1964, a common type of pipe used was called Orangeburg, which was used in this location. It is essentially layered wood pulp that is pressed together. Many of these pipes have collapsed 
Additionally, there is biomat buildup, which also prevents the effluent from draining into the soil. There are also some concrete septic tanks that have corroded due to 57 years of sewer gases. Since the effluent no longer seeps into the ground, our sanitation operations staff have been pumping out the septic tanks and hauling the wastewater about twice a week for the last few years. This is not a, a viable long-term solution. In 2019, Public Works contracted with Biosphere Consulting to look into the problem and design a fix. Public Works staff also held a community meeting to let the residents know of the issue on November 13th, 2019, and let them know of potential costs. Our team worked extensively with the Water Board on a design that would meet the Water Board's requirements for treatment. Once we finalized the design of the septic system with the Water Board, we developed a cost estimate, consulted with the county, the county Debt Committee on the best financing options, and subsequently enlisted a team to work on an assessment district, which includes bonds to pay for the project. This team includes an assessment engineer, which is Jeff Nace from Bowman and Williams, bond counsel Scott, Scott Ferguson from Jones Hall, and a municipal advisor, Suzanne Harrell from Harrell and Associates. The total project cost estimate is $2,870,000, which includes construction, design, administration, inspection, assessment district costs, bond issuance costs, and also the construction. So what this means for residents is that the per parcel assessment costs to pay for the project would be as shown as, the, on, as on the current slide. The property owners would be able to opt for a lump sum payment or have an annual assessment over 30 years. Public Works held a subsequent community meeting on January 27th to go over the proposed assessments and the next steps. There are numerous steps involved uh, to form an assessment district and we're in the highlighted step. Previously, the board has approved the engineer's report and intention to form an assessment district, which happened on March 23rd of this year. That same date, the board approved Public Works to advertise for bidders for the construction. Ballots were mailed out to the residents on March 30th. We also opened bids for the construction on April 28th. At today's meeting, the steps are to open the public meeting to hear objections and protests, then close the public testimony, and then continue the item to later in today's meeting, which will allow for tabulation and certification of the assessment ballots, which are required to be returned by the close of today's public hearing on the item. Once the ballots are tabulated and certified, the board will, would return to the item to announce the results of the balloting and then close the public hearing. If the assessment ballot, balloting passes, the bond closing is scheduled for July 20th and we expect to start construction around August 2nd. I also wanna point out that the votes are weighted, so a parcel with a higher assessment will have their vote be weighted more than a parcel with a lower assessment. We only count the votes received and in order for the assessment to pass, the results of the ballots received must show that there is not a majority protest to the formation of the assessment district. I'll read the recommended actions for the board, which spells out everything in a little bit more detail. So recommended action number one is to open the public hearing and hear objections and protests, if any, to the proposed County of Santa Cruz, uh, Santa Cruz County service area number two, assessment district number 21-01, place steam septic system project or assessment district. Close the public testimony portion of the public hearing and then continue the item to allow for tabulation and certification of the ballots. Once that's done, the board would return to the item to announce the results of the balloting, and that'll be done by our deputy CAO, uh, Director of Public Works, Matt Machado. Then the close the public hearing, and then, find, and then next would be to accept the certification of the vote results and direct the deputy CAO, Director of Public Works, to retain the ballots for at least six months prior to following the certification. And finally, recommended action number seven, and this is kind of a long one. Um, if the results of the balloting shows no majority protest to the formation of assessment district number 21-01, the recommendation is to adopt a resolution adopting the engineer's report, confirming the assessment, ordering work and acquisitions, and directing actions with respect thereto. Direct the clerk of the board to publish an assessment notice once a week for two weeks, beginning on May 29th, 2021, in a newspaper of general circulation. Direct Public Works to mail an assessment notice to the property owners within the assessment district and record an assessment notice with the county recorder. Adopt a resolution authorizing issuance of bonds, approving and directing the execution of a fiscal agent agreement, bond purchase agreement and official statement, and approving related documents and actions. 
authorize the deputy CAO director of public works to award and sign the contract with the qualified low bidder, direct public works to return on or before August 24th, 2021 for ratification of the contract award and finally authorize the CAO, assistant CAO and auditor controller tax collector to take all actions required to issue the bonds. I also want to point out that while we are opening the ballots, um, we will have a live Zoom link, which is separate from this meeting. If any member of the community wants us to wants to watch the opening of the ballots, so that um, is that link is shown on the, the Department of Public Works website, which is www.dpw.co.santa-cruz.ca.us, and that link is located on the bottom left portion of the the website. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, we also have, um, I'm available for, for questions. We also have bond council staff and our staff from our sanitation group as well to answer any questions as well as some of our other consultants. Thank you for your thorough uh, presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I will go to open the public hearing to hear objections or protests, if any, to the proposed County of Santa Cruz service area number two, assessment district number 2101, place to more septic system project, assessment district. Uh, do we have any comment? No, we have one comment coming in. Do we have any comments coming in from the public? Yes, I have the previous caller at 5959. Your microphone is available. Thank you for your patience too. Caller 5959, you are unmuted. Okay, we can go to caller 2915. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I am not in uh, this uh, assessment district boundary, but I do have two questions that I would like staff to answer this morning during the public hearing for the public's benefit. Uh, please confirm who it is, which agency it is that is or has already tabulated the, the ballots. And I appreciate having the, the live stream video. I I cannot uh, participate in that, but I appreciate that that is available. So please confirm who it is that has the, the ballots and will be the custodian of the ballots for six months. Normally it's two years. But the second question I have is, what is the anticipated cost per uh, parcel? These are weighted ballots. So uh, the benefit will assumingly be greater for those parcels that receive more benefit, um, what will be the cost to these property owners? Thank you. That concludes my comment. Thank you. I would like Thank the question. Can we answer those questions, Mr. Edler? Sure. So the uh, Department of Public Works will be tabulating the ballots and we'll be also um, holding on to those ballots. Um, and then the annual, uh, the, the total assessment rates, those are, there's three different assessments. So there's um, the condos, which is $29,309.56. Um, then there's the homes, the single family dwellings in the park area, which is that assessment would be $49,399.15. And then the townhouses, um, which are along the beach, would be $31,520.52. And so the, um, and then going through the annual cost for those, the condos would be $1,612.53. The single family dwellings, their annual cost would be $2,667.32. And the townhomes would be, um, would have an annual assessment of $1,734.16. Thank you for having that, that criteria um, readily available. Thank you. Another, do we have another caller, the one that wanted to get in earlier? Yes. I have caller two also available, and then I will okay. give instructions to caller 5959 when they're up again. Very good. 
User T, your microphone is available. This is Marilyn Garrett. It would be helpful when staff is doing their report and I am on a landline uh, that you say where the area is, uh, specifically the geographical area. And um, I don't, it, it seems like sometimes these votes are questionable of the telling. I have a friend in the San Lorenzo Water District who's built on way up. And I, it, it, anyway, I just uh, have, have questions about that. And it's also interesting how at least people can vote on this uh, increased taxes, but we can't vote on things like broadband radiation being forced upon us. Uh, no informed consent there. Um, th those are my comments, thank you. Caller 5959, your microphone is available. Please press star six to unmute your phone. Chair, the caller is not responding. I believe they've decided not to speak. Okay, and that, that's it. Is there anybody oh, else? There are no other speakers to this item. Okay, if that person should try to come on again, we'll, uh, that have, we'll, we'll close the public hearing otherwise and return it to the board. Uh, are there any comments from uh, board members? Uh, Supervisor Friend? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Edler. And, and I do know that we have received some outreach from some constituents that's concerned about it, but I do appreciate the work of Public Works providing explanation about uh, the condition and uh, what's necessary here. Obviously, it is an expensive investment that's needed. And um, I do have a question that's sort of a more macro question, just based on the overall sphere of what's possible within the sanitation district, recognizing that sewer service does extend to uh, seascape at least, what would be the long-term possibility of a sewer extension at least down into this region? Would such a thing be possible for us to do? I definitely think it, it's possible. Um, it's It would be something that would be more um, probably financially doable for the for the residents, the more you have. So we could, you could bring in a larger area like the, the larger La Silva Beach area. Um, so that way, the the, the costs of, the, of such a system would be spread out um, and would be less uh, to have a to pipe everything from seventy three residents to connect into the larger sanitation district would be um, the cost would be in, extremely high. My estimate would probably be around thirteen to fifteen million dollars, and that's that's a lot of money. We'd probably need about four pump stations to to get it there, um, and about two miles of pipe. Right, and, and I was I was thinking about it more broadly than that, including the communities that are unserved along the way. I recognize historically that that previous boards have made decisions about um, lack of sewer extension. I, I just think that as these systems, both not just in my district, but I, I know definitely in the San Lorenzo Valley and and and, and Supervisor Koenig's district as well, uh, are continuing to fail. There needs to be, I think, a broader discussion about the extension of sewer services uh, into these areas where feasible. This is an important transition process that's being proposed right here because there's there's a very serious situation that's being faced right in that area right now, and this will help stabilize it. But I think that uh, for a future board 20 years from now or, or so, it'd be nice to think about an infrastructure extension into some of these areas, especially when we know the conditions of some of these, um, you know, some of these these septic systems throughout throughout the county. And so. Just something I think that that is, um, as somebody who also serves on the sanitation district uh, with you, and I appreciate that, um, that and with Supervisor Koenig, I think that it's something I think we should have a maybe a broader study session look at about how capital investments can help alleviate these moving forward. I mean, I know that if I were a resident and I had to pay for an investment, I'd rather pay for an investment that has a long-term solution, uh, a very long-term solution than maybe something that, that doesn't. Those are my, my only questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the board? Um, even though I've closed the public hearing, I want to make sure that uh, initial caller did not try to get back in. Is that correct? 
have a, another speaker that possibly may be. There's another user that has raised their hand to speak. Yeah, I'll let that happen uh, under the circumstances. I'm not sure who it is. Even though I closed the public hearing, I'll uh, reopen it to, for this one caller. Thank you, Marie Garcia. Your microphone is available. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is Ellen Simon's box again. I um, I don't know if I this. We're having trouble with. It's okay, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Ellen Simon's box. I own 165 Holiday Drive in La Selva Beach. My family purchased our home in 1976 before the home was built, and we have lived there since 1977. Our second and third generations are now enjoying 165 Holiday. We are and have been a family with a light footprint on our home and our septic system and our water use. I understand the system must be upgraded and replaced. We have paid $1,233 a year for 44 years. Short-term rentals have abused and overused the septic system. The short-term rentals have changed our bucolic neighborhood. This incredibly engineered new septic system, I feel, is unjustly burdening those of us who have had a light footprint on our property for decades and is being built to accommodate those owners who are abusing our septic systems and neighborhoods. Why not assess us on our water usage? The SoCal Water District has all of our records a $49,000 lien assessment for an over-engineered system to accommodate short-term landlords who are abusing their properties is horrific. I urge you to readjust your assessments and rebid your costs. Thank you. Thank you. And that, that closes the public hearing. Um, we will, um, if there's no further comments from the board, um, We'll um, wait to bring back the vote uh, from item number seven. Uh, we will delay action on this item until we have uh, found out what the, uh, the results of the vote were. And uh, after, uh, that'll come after item number nine on today's agenda. We only have two more items to go before we have a closed uh, session. So we will uh, we've closed the public hearing. Uh, we'll uh, direct staff to uh, tabulate the results and return to us at uh, as we close uh, item number nine, hopefully. So we will go to item number eight at this point. Mr. Chair, just as a point of clarification before uh, Mr. Edler leaves, council, does that require us to take an action to continue this item to that point? Do you need an actual action? No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank okay, you. very good. Thank you. Very good. Uh, we'll go to item number eight, a public hearing to consider resolution confirming proposed fiscal year 2021-22 benefit assessment rate and service charge reports for the county service areas 60, or excuse me, 53, 53N, 53S for mosquito abatement and disease control as outlined in the memorandum of the agricultural commissioner. Uh, we have the rates attachment for CSA 53, 53S, and 53N. Uh, resolution 2021 CSA 53 assessment rate reports. Is Mr. Hidalgo going to be presenting this? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, good morning, Chair, members of the board, members of the public. Juan Hidalgo, Agricultural Commissioner. Uh, joining me today is our our new Mosquito and Vector Control Division Manager, Amanda Paulson, who started in that role last October. Um, Amanda has a bachelor's degree in environmental science and management, and she also has a master's degree in um, uh, uh, ecology with uh, an emphasis on vector-borne diseases from UC Davis. And she also brings her experience as a vector ecologist from Santa Clara and Santa Cruz County. Um, our previous manager, Paul Binding, uh, retired last September after more than 25 years uh, uh, providing services to our community and our county. So I'm pleased to have uh, Amanda join our team and Amanda will uh, go ahead and introduce uh, the item today. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, for the warm welcome and good morning, everyone. 
Um, I'm Amanda Paulson, the Assistant Manager for Mosquito and Vector Control Division of the Agriculture Com Agricultural Commissioner's Office. Um, the County Service Area, CSA 53, was established in 1993 and then expanded in 2004 and 2005 for South and North County, respectively, to provide mosquito control and public health services to the entire Santa Cruz County. These services are funded by a benefit assessment and rates are adjusted each year to account for inflation. On April 13, 2021, the board set today, May 18th, as the public hearing date on the proposed benefit assessment rate reports that will provide operational funding for mosquito infection control in 2022. The CSA rates presented have previously been approved by the board and are outlined in the rates attachment and either remain at the same level as in 2020 to 2021 or have rates in a consumer price index increase of 2%. These rates have been posted in the local newspapers and made available to the public and the clerk, at the clerk of the board and the Mosquito and Vector Control website prior to today's hearing. If approved, rate reports will be forwarded to the Auditor Controller by August 10th to be included in the 2021 to 2022 property tax assessment role. We recommend the board open the public hearing to hear objections or protests to the proposed three assessment rates um, for CSA 53, which is north and south in the original. Um, and then please close the hearing and then consider adoption of the resolution confirming the benefit assessment rate reports for the 2021 to 2022 fiscal year. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will open the public hearing. Is there anyone that would like to address us about item number eight? Yes, Chair, there are members of the public that would like to address the board. Call in user two, your microphone is available. And as a reminder, it is star six to mute or unmute if you're calling in from a phone. Uh, hello, it was difficult to understand Amanda, um, for some reason, the voice was echoey on, um, I could hear the agricultural commissioner, um, but my worries with abatement is that almost always it's use of toxic pesticides that get into the environment and affect more than the targeted insect. I don't know how much of this is ecological, but um, there are an enormous number of pesticides that cause cancer, neurological problems. The list goes on and on. And um, I'm very much opposed to increasing poisons like that in the environment. Again, I request when you're discussing an area with all the numbers that you state, you know, is this Aptos? Is it the entire county? What what area is it? On the last item, I didn't hear the Selva Beach area until the discussion later on. So just for clarification, that's my request. Thank you. There are no other speakers to this item, Chair. Okay. I will close the public hearing. Is, is there any, um, Mr. Hidalgo or, or Ms. Mullins, can you generally tell us the area you're talking about uh, geographically? Uh, is it the agricultural area in general or is it whatever? Uh, yes, Chair. So the Mosquito and Vector Control Division operates countywide. Uh, so the rates apply to both South and North County. Um, our work is performed in all locations of the county. And uh, depending on the location, there are some minor differentiations in the rate, but it's a service that, service that is provided countywide. Thank you. Mr. Okay. Chair, I, I'd just like to make a brief comment. First, I'd like to welcome Ms. Paulson. Uh, we're very fortunate to have you. Uh, Mr. Binding was wonderful, but, but it sounds like you're exceptionally qualified. Also, these costs are, are really de minimis compared to what value we receive out of them. 
Uh, we're one of the reasons why we maybe don't value it that much is because of the great work that that team does on Mr. Odalgo's team across the country and across the world. Uh, mosquitoes uh, cause a significant amount of health related issues. And we are in a community that really does not have those issues as a result of the work that this team does. So I, I have to just say that I consider it to be not just a bargain, but also a, an essential public health investment that this board makes. It's a very small ask of our local residents to make that public health investment. So I'd like to, I appreciate her and the work of Mr. Hidalgo and would be absolutely, and would actually like to move uh, the recommended actions on this item. Okay. Motion to make. Second. Second from Coonerty. Coonerty, thank you. Sorry. Um, and I think Mr. I think Mr. Uh, has a comment. Yeah. I'll make a quick comment. Oh, you. excuse me. All right, Mr. Supervisor Captain. That's okay. Uh, how you doing, Juan? Hanging in there. <clears throat> okay, I want to thank you and your staff. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for your report also. I'm uh, I'm amazed at how much uh, work comes out of your office and small staff, really, and how much uh, you uh, benefit uh, South County. Uh, uh, you stand up for the agriculture workers and uh, uh, and look out for the general public uh, with all these health issues. I uh, just want to thank you and your staff uh, for all the hard work you do. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, any other comments from the board? We have motion to second, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We will go to item number nine, to consider authorizing the auditor controller treasurer tax collector to proceed with necessary actions to secure the 2021-22 tax and revenue anticipation notes. Those are referred to as trans, you might hear that term, tax and revenue, uh, revenue anticipation notes in an amount not to exceed 48 million five hundred thousand dollars adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance of the, and sale of the 2021-22 tax and revenue anticipation notes approve the execution and delivery of a continuing disclosure certificate approving the form of the official statement and note purchase agreement approving the distribution of a preliminary official statement and an official statement and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. We have a draft of the Santa Cruz County 2021-22 trans uh, POS May 10th, uh, 2021, a resolution uh, authorizing the issuance of those and NPA the County of Santa Cruz 2021-22 trans. Um, who will be presenting on this? Um, I will be. Edith Triscoll? Yes, I, Edith Triscoll. You're our auditor, controller, tra tax collector, treasurer, and everything else that uh, makes the, the county run on money. So, Ex go ahead. Excellent. Well, thank you for that introduction. Good morning, Chair McPherson and members of the board. Um, as mentioned, Edith Driscoll, auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. Also joining us this morning is Suzanne Harold, the municipal financial advisor for the county on this bond issue. The item before your board today is a request to authorize myself, the county auditor controller, to proceed with the necessary actions to secure the 21-22 tax and revenue anticipation note, also referred to as a TRAN, in the amount not to exceed $48.5 million. $48 million. A TRAN is a short-term financing tool to assist the county with its cash flow management throughout the upcoming year. The funds from the bond sale are received early in the year, and we pay them back at the end of the year. At set, intro at set intervals, revenues are set aside to allow the bond to be paid back in a one-time lump sum amount at the end of the fiscal year. The county has issued TRANs for many years in the past as a management tool for cash management. In past years, I have explained that the TRAN is very helpful to respond to inconsistencies between when property taxes are paid and received and when the county needs to begin paying its expenditures. Property taxes are primarily funding source and they are primarily not received until December, December and again in April. The county, of course, begins paying budgeted expenditures as early as July 1. 
This situation is still true for the upcoming year. However, this year the TRAN will be even more important as the county waits to receive various FEMA payments that have and are be being filed by fiscal staff related to the extraordinary expenditures and the extraordinary cash outflow related to the CZU fire and the COVID pandemic. Specifically, when sizing the amount of this year's TRAN, the timing of the FEMA claims was taken into consideration and it was determined to increase the TRAN from the amount of last year, which was 46.5 million to 48.5 million. This determination was made after the county's fiscal team performed extensive analysis of the expected cash flow for the rest of the fiscal year, as well as the upcoming year. Regarding the method of sale for this year's TRAN, the county's finance team is once again recommending selling the TRAN through a negotiated sale. This will mirror how the TRAN was sold in the previous fiscal year when we were also experiencing the effects of COVID on the county's cash flow, as well as the recent effects of the CZU fire. The TRAN last year was not issued until September, although normally, traditionally, we issue it in August, uh, June. This year, our concerns specifically are focused on the timing of FEMA reimbursements and the very, very narrow cash margins the county is experiencing next fiscal year. Again, this year, we recommend using a negotiated sale with one underwriter who can best communicate to the investors on this sale. Raymond James was selected um, this year as well as last year to be able to explain our situation to, uh, in, in its best light. In addition to borrowing the cash flow, the TRAN will also include an amount necessary for a portion of the 2021 delinquencies under the teeter plan. This is consistent with past practices. Under the teeter plan, the county distributes property tax revenues to the cities and agencies based upon the total amount billed on the property tax bills, as opposed to the actual amount received. Therefore, we allow these entities to have a guaranteed even cash flow and expected revenue source. In exchange, the county receives the penalties and interest on any delinquent taxes when they are finally collected. In recent years, the county has received the highest rating for our short-term debt from both Standard & Poor's and Moody's. County's fiscal team will again make presentations to both of these agencies in the next few days. At this time, we do not anticipate any rating changes. However, both of these agencies, we do expect to uh, review our preliminary budget for the 21-22 fiscal year extensively. As reflected in the board item before you, I request that you approve the recommended actions authorizing me to proceed with the necessary steps to secure the 21-22 tax and revenue anticipation notes in the amount not to exceed $48.5 million dollars and that you adopt the resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of the TRAN, approve the execution and delivery of the continuing disclosure certificate, approve the form of the official statement and note purchase agreement, approve the distribution of the preliminary official statement and an official statement and authorize necessary actions on the execution of the documents in connection with this issuance. This concludes my presentation. Both myself and Suzanne Harold, our financial advisor, um, are available for any questions. Suzanne is also on this call. Thank you. Thank you. And you made, you made that as understandable as can be. <laughs> so thank you. It's not easy, but uh, we are uh, working with others to make this happen. Are there any comments from the board? Yeah, I, if I may. Yes, sir. Okay. Supervisor thank yeah, hi, uh, the, how you doing, Edith? Excellent, thank you. Good, how's your son doing in college? Excellent. Good, glad to hear that. Uh, I wanna thank you for your report and uh, uh, I trust your uh, uh, math skills and everything and it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to move all these numbers. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Supervisor Friend, did you have a comment? No. Anybody have a comment from the board? Uh, any comments from the public? Yes, I currently have one caller. Call in user two. Your microphone is available. Uh, hello, I was listening to Edith Driscoll's comments and about extraordinary expenditures for all this uh, under the rubric of COVID. 
And here's a little insight into why this is happening. And Santa Cruz County is not the only one. So I'm reading here um, from an introduction by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. You referred to COVID. This is called The Truth About COVID-19, Exposing the Great Reset, Lockdowns, Vaccine Passports, and the New Normal by Dr. Joseph Mercola. I highly recommend it. In America, quarantine predictably shattered the nation's one spooning economic engine, putting 58 million Americans out of work and permanently bankrupting over 100,000 small businesses, including 41,000 black-owned businesses, some of which took three generations of investment to build. These policies have also set into motion the inevitable dismantling of the social safety net that nurtured America's envied middle class. Government officials have already begun liquidating the 100 years legacy of the New Deal, New Frontier, the Great Society, and Obamacare to pay the accumulated quarantine debts, say goodbye to school lunch, health care with Medicaid, Medicare, university scholarships, and more. While obliterating the American middle class and dropping an additional 8% of Americans below the poverty line, the 2020 COVID... Any other comments from the public? There are no other speakers to this item, Chair. Okay, I'll return it to the board for action. Mr. Chair, I'll move the recommended actions with appreciation for Ms. Driscoll's work. Second. Koenig. Koenig. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. That completes our regular agenda. Do we have uh, results of counting the ballots on item number seven? Just a moment here. I'm promoting Mr. Adler back to panelist. Sure. Okay. He is joined again as a panelist. Do you have access to your microphone, Kent? There we go. Yes, I do. Sorry, I was running back from the conference room. <laughs> So I believe um, Matt Machado, can he be elevated as well? I think he was going to give the, the results. Okay. So just for clarification, Chair, for the public, we're returning to item seven at this point to continue right. the public hearing on uh, the formation of the assessment district, correct? Yes. Now, do the public hearing has been closed, though. The, 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 pub, the public testimony portion of the public hearing yeah. has been closed, but the public hearing is continuing just to accept the uh, results and to take further board action. Very good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. If I may, are you ready? Yes. All right. Thank you for your patience, Chair and Supervisors. Uh, Matt Machado, Deputy CAO and Director of Public Works. Uh, public Works staff have tabulated and certified the assessment ballots for the proposed County of Santa Cruz service area number two, assessment district number 21-01, place to MER septic system project. Uh, I certify that the results of the ballots are 69% in favor of the assessment district formation and 31% in protest or not in favor of the assessment district formation. We did receive 37 ballots. Uh, so at this point, the recommended actions are to close the public hearing, <clears throat> to accept the certification of the vote results and direct the deputy CAO director of public works to retain the ballots for at least six months following the certification and <clears throat> the long item uh, recommended number seven to adopt a resolution adopting the engineer's report confirming the assessment ordering work and acquisitions and directing actions with respect thereto direct the clerk of the board to publish an assessment notice once a week for two weeks beginning 
May 29, 2021, in a newspaper of general circulation, direct public works to mail an assessment notice to the property owners within assessment district and record an assessment notice with county recorder, adopt resolution authorizing issuance of bonds, approving and directing the execution of a fiscal agent agreement, bond purchase agreement, and official statement, and approving related documents and actions, authorize the deputy CAO director of public works to award and sign the contract with the qualified low bidder, direct public works to return on or before August 24th, 2021, for ratification of the contract award, and to authorize the CAO, assistant CAO, and, and auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector to take all, re all actions required to issue the bonds, and we can answer any questions you may have. Before we uh, ask for a vote um, or a motion, any questions from the board? Uh, entertain a motion to follow the direction uh, just outlined by uh, Deputy CAO, um, Director of Public Works, Matt Machado, uh, entertain a motion. Yes, Mr. I'll Chair, um, I'd just like to appreciate the work of the Public Works as well as the community out there who have spoken pretty significantly in favor of the creation of this assessment district. I'd like to move all the recommended actions. Okay, I did hear that Mr. Caput made the second, I believe it's- I'll make, it, uh, I'll make it a second. Uh, okay, very well. Please call the roll. Thank you, Amber, for clarification. The mover is Supervisor Friend and seconder Supervisor Caput. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, that, that concludes our regular agenda. We will now move into uh, executive closed session. There are four items on the uh, closed session agenda. Is there anything reportable, uh, Mr. Council? There's nothing reportable today. Thank you. Okay, then we will um, we will move into closed session. Uh, the hour is uh, just after 10, 10 06. At 10 15, we will reconvene in closed session. The regular meeting uh, is adjourned. <laughs>